We'll begin our reading in just a moment, make our prayer, and jump into the message. Isaiah 47 is not a, mess, it's not a passage of Scripture that is preached often. It doesn't really have a, a sermon flow to it uh, as it speaks of the destruction of Babylon. Many times preachers will use it as reference uh, when referring to the destruction of Babylon, but not really preach through the chapter. We're going to try to accomplish that this morning, and so if the message makes sense, it's because of the Lord. Uh, if it doesn't make sense, obviously it's me. Uh, but we're going to try to pull some principles and precepts for our life uh, from the Scripture. We'll begin our reading in verse number 1, Isaiah chapter 47. The Bible says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the lag, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. The nakedness, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel, sit thou silent. And give thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. And thou sayest, I shall be a lady forever so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that saith in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children." May God bless His Word as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning. Lord, I pray You would help us as we look at these biblical truths and, Lord, the history of Your people. And I pray, Lord, that You would show us truths to help us to grow and move us forward in our Christian life. And, Lord, I pray that You'd be glorified with every aspect of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our series in the book of Isaiah, we come to the 47th chapter of this wonderful book in our Bible. Chapter 47 continues really to develop the work of Cyrus and his conquest of, of Babylon. In the previous chapter, we noted the weakness of Babylon's gods, and God would call Cyrus to free Israel from captivity. In the 45th chapter, the Bible says, I've raised him up in righteousness, this is Cyrus, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives. Not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Cyrus will allow Judah to rebuild Jerusalem. And the Bible says, because Babylon showed no mercy in their defeat of Judah, God would show them no mercy in their defeat to the Persians. Now, Jerusalem was captured in about 587 B.C. Cyrus defeated Babylon in 539 B.C. And really, the passage of Scripture before us is really an extremely incredible prophecy. It's like a, a chocolate cake, various layers. God is prophesying the captivity of His people. And then He gives to us the very prophecy of the defeat of those captors. And God is showing us that He's in control of the circumstances of life. That He is the one that is directing the parade of time. That, that God is ultimately in control. And yet, I, I think that there's also an incredible principle for our life and for our nation, for our church. Is how does a nation so powerful, how, how does a people like Babylon so great become so shamed? How does a people so strong and mighty become humbled? 
as they are illustrated in this chapter as a woman in the dirt from, from disgrace and, and, uh, and really just demotion of that, uh, of that position that uh, was allowed them by God. And so we find some insights here from the Word of God as we look at these truths. We're going we're gonna to go through this chapter together, and, and uh, our prayer is that the Lord would teach us and direct us from His Word. So if you're taking notes this morning, would you write with me number one? I want us to start from the beginning here, the destruction of Babylon. The destruction of Babylon. Again, God chooses to illustrate this people as, as a woman, and the Bible notes here in verse number 1, it says, O virgin daughter of Babylon, the woman is noted here as pure and, and wholesome. And yet this woman who is pure and wholesome is now sitting in the dust or in the dirt. No more on the throne, the Bible says. No more in a position of authority. No more in a high position. But instead, we notice letter A, her disgrace in verse number 1, it says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. We notice here the picture is of a woman who is rich, a woman that is pure, and she is stripped from her wealth. And the Bible says she is forced into being a slave. No longer elevated on the throne. Babylon is lying in the dirt and in disgrace. You know, when we look at our Bibles, we open up from the very beginning in the book of Genesis in the third chapter. We read about the fall of Adam and Eve and Satan, Lucifer, coming as a serpent and deceiving Eve and Eve taking of that fruit and and then giving that fruit to, to her husband, Adam. And the Bible says all of humanity was plunged into sin that day. And, and the Bible says that, that God would, would give punishment to Lucifer. And, and the Scripture says that on his belly he would go, and he would eat the dust all the days of his life. And this really speaks of this position of humiliation, that the, the devil be thrust to the ground. And that's the picture of Babylon in this passage of Scripture, that they were once in a high position in society. They were on the throne. They were in control. They had authority. And now she was thrust to the ground and in the dirt and in the dust. And it shows her disgrace uh, in this passage of Scripture. We notice also, number two here, her demotion. Her demotion. The Bible says in verse 2, Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the lag, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. And so we see from the height of popularity to now a people in captivity. Babylon is illustrated here as this woman being brought into slavery. It, it says here to, to take the millstone and grind meal and in Bible days, this was really the task of a servant. We, we read about this in Exodus chapter 11 and verse number 5. The Bible says, And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even upon the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. The Bible says in this passage of Scripture that here, we see a demotion that she has been thrust into being a servant from a place of, of, of position and now to a place of lowliness. But not only do we notice her demotion, we also notice in verses 2-5 to five her desolation. Her desolation. The Bible says that Babylon, would the, the veil would be pulled back. Or the Bible says here that uh, she will uncover the locks. In other words, it says that everyone will see her humiliation. Everyone will see her, her desolation. That she will leave her wealth behind. She will uncover the thigh is an idea of when a woman would cross a river. She would pull up that, that, that skirt or she would pull up that, um, that robe and she would cross that river. And, and the thought here is, is Babylon being brought into a land they didn't want to go. That they would leave their homeland. They would be brought to a land that they were forced to go to. They would be brought to a place of captivity. 
in verses 3, the Bible says, Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. The Bible says in this passage of Scripture that God would take vengeance upon this ungodly, wicked people. That God would not meet them as a man. The expression there is the idea of a a man meeting a woman and greeting that woman with blessing and with honor. And yet God would would not meet with honor and blessing. That God would come with fire and with judgment and with destruction. He says here that the Holy One in Israel, our Redeemer, Uh, He says, will declare, he will stand up for us, Isaiah said. He will fight on our behalf. He he will fight for us. And and Babylon will no longer be called the lady here of kingdoms. No more a mighty nation. No more a nation of position. But in fact, she will be seen in shame. She will be seen in desolation. And darkness or sorrow will cover the land because of the fact that they showed no mercy to the people of God. We see letter D there. Would you write it down? Her demands. Her demands. The Bible says in verse 6, I was wroth with my people. God says, I I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient has thou very heavily laid thy yoke. God said, listen, I was angry with my people. We, we know from uh, the sin that they committed, Judah's idolatry, that God had brought them into this exile. God allowed, and that's the key word here, God allowed the Babylonians to come. God allowed this unclean nation to conquer his people And yet God focuses on the fact that Babylon showed them no mercy. That the the older men and women of Judah, that that demanding hard labors were placed upon them. God says a heavy yoke was upon them. And no mercy, no mercy was given to them. You, You know, let me say this, Christians, how important it is for us to be a people of mercy. And I say it's important because it's important to God. It's important to God. And, and mercy, it, it implies benevolence and tenderness and mildness and pity, compassion. And it's to be exercised toward offenders. Mercy is an attribute of Almighty God. And God wants us to be a people of mercy today. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 says this, But put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy and kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. God wants us to be kind. He wants us to be a people of meekness and patient and humble and a people of mercy or grace in our world today. A mother once approached Napoleon seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense twice and justice demanded his death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, Napoleon replied. Sir, the woman said, It would not be mercy if he deserved it. And it is mercy that I ask for. Are you glad today that God showed you mercy? (laughs) Amen to that. God showed us grace. We are to be a people of grace. When an offense is brought before us, we can either get even or we can be like God and show mercy. The Bible says that Babylon showed no mercy toward Judah. And this angered the Lord. We see not only the destruction of Babylon, but number two, would you write it down, the direction of Babylon. The direction of Babylon. Now the Bible gives us 
a sobering commentary of how Babylon got to this place. The Bible says that they had become a perverted people in their pursuit. And really, three simple points are found in this passage of Scripture between verses 7 to 9. Real simple truths that I want us to apply these principles to our life this morning as we continue to use and illustrate here Babylon as a woman, we see letter A, that she believed she could never fall. She believed that she could never fall. She believed that she was indestructible. Look what the Bible says in verse 7. The Bible says, And thus sayest, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things in thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. You know, it's interesting when God's people was brought into captivity in Babylon, the words of Isaiah and the words of God was brought there as well. And they had in their hands the very words of God that they would become a nation that would crumble under the Persians, under Cyrus. And yet the Bible says they did not not put these words to their heart. Because they believed that they were indestructible. They believed that they could never fall. That they could never stumble. That they would be a lady forever. A ruler. A queen. A place of of high position. There is no way that we would ever fall. Was their attitude. I'm sure everyone has this attitude in their life. From time to time. I remember when I was 15 years old. When my dad passed away. Um, I remember when he, was, uh, when he went to the hospital, and I remember as a young man, I, I still remember what I was doing. I was playing road hockey uh, in front of my house, and I remember a gentleman in our church, an older gentleman who was very close to my dad, had pulled his car up and wanted me to get inside, and he was telling me the, the seriousness of the situation, that my dad was in hospital and was very sick. And I remember as he was talking, the whole time my attitude was, well, nothing's going to happen to him because I know that that things happen to other people and events happen to other people and other people's dads pass away. But that could never happen to me. That that could never happen to our home. And, And that's often the attitude that we get when it comes to life, that it could never come here. It, it could never happen to me. No, no, the devil could never attack me. The, the devil could never hurt me. And And so we have this attitude that it would never be us, that that we are indestructible, that that we are much too mighty, we are much too strong, we are much too wise. We could never fall. And yet because of this very attitude within Babylon, and God mentions it in His Holy Word, that they did not even look to the result of their sin. They they didn't even consider the prophecy in verse 6. They didn't lay these things in their heart. The Scripture says. And this morning, I want to warn each of us to never have this attitude. To never think that we would never give in to temptation. That never think that we are beyond shipwrecking in our life. That the devil would never hurt me. Or that we would never give in to that sin. Or that we would never ever do that. Listen, friends, we have to understand that we are all sinners today. And that we are all in one moment of weakness can fall beneath its weight. And that's why the Bible warns us. That's why the Bible says to be vigilant. That's why the Bible says to give diligence. That's why the the Bible tells us to pay attention in our life. Because in just one moment we can be what we never thought we'd ever be. And God says pay attention. In 1 Peter, 2 Peter, excuse me, verse Chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. And the Bible is talking about adding to your faith and being a growing Christian. It is dangerous when you become stagnant. It is dangerous when you stand still in your Christian life. You should be continually adding to your faith. Having that confidence in the Lord's work in your life. The Bible says give diligence. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, 
Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Friend, listen to me. We need to be careful to think that we are indestructible. We need to be careful to think that we are untouchable by the devil because families just like yours and teens just like yours and children just like yours and mom and dads just like you and Christians just like you have fallen and we are not better than them. We need to be careful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. It's important to never put ourselves in a position where we would fall victim to our own flesh. The Bible says, make no provision for your flesh. I'm talking this morning to moms and dads and and who have small children and teens, to be careful with electronics and your children. The internet is a terrible place. A terrible place. You say, well, you don't trust your children. I don't even trust myself. God, help us today to take heed. To take heed, lest ye fall. There's a danger here. A danger here. The Bible says that Babylon thought that they were indestructible. It could never happen to us. I see letter B that she followed after pleasures. In verse number 8, the Bible says that they were given over to pleasures. The phrase here, that thou art given to pleasures, the thought is, O sensual one, is the idea. And here the Lord addresses her as though she had really over-feasted on the spoils of her life, that she lived carelessly with no thought of danger and no thought of tomorrow. The reality is that Babylon didn't care who she hurt. And Babylon didn't care where she ended up. She only cared about following what she wanted. Her attitude was, I won't listen to anyone. I won't hear advice. I won't listen to reason. I just want what I want. And that was the direction of her life. You know, we use the expression, love is blind. You heard that before, right? I think that love is also dumb, by the way. <laughs> the, the idea of love is blind is not speaking about true love, because true love is a choice. And we know that it's a verb, and it's an action word, and it, it declares action in our life. Uh, even when we are unlovable, God so loved that he gave. Amen? That's a wonderful thing. And that is what true love is all about. But often when, when two young people, they get caught up in this, this idea of love, it really is just an emotional excitement that they have and it wears off and, and they find someone else that they can have that emotional excitement with. And, and I know Hollywood is really parading that and promoting that and you know dating is a sport in Hollywood. But listen, Dating is to find the one that God has for you to marry. And that's the purpose of it. And yet oftentimes, these two individuals, they don't listen to the advice of a loving mom and a loving dad who sees the entire situation and, and, and can see angles that they cannot, they cannot see. And, and so what happens is they carelessly continue down that pathway of their own desire. And they follow after pleasure and not principle. And that's a dangerous thing. When you follow after pleasure and not principle. And the Bible teaches us that Babylon was traveling after pleasures. Pleasure had become their gods. Pleasure had become their guide. And if we follow after pleasure, it always leads us to heartache, to destruction, to hurt. The Bible says she followed after pleasures and then let her see she didn't consider the end. The Bible says in verse number 8, Therefore hear now this, that thou art given to pleasures, thou dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thy heart, I am and there, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, 
neither will I know the loss of children. Verse 9, but these two things shall come to thee in a moment and one day. The Bible says that she lifted up herself as the only one that is important. By the way, I was taught that in public school. Like, that's what our world teaches, that you're number one. It's all about you. It doesn't matter about anyone else. As long as you're happy, then, then, then you're okay. That, that is a terrible philosophy. A terrible philosophy. Because when you live your life for the pleasures of this world to, to fulfill your own sinful heart, it's like eating cotton candy. Have you ever had a big, giant handful of cotton candy and you threw it in your mouth and poof, it's gone. And you're like, where did it go? <laughs> the reality is it doesn't satisfy. You can't have a meal with cotton candy. There's no substance to it. There's nothing there to fulfill your life. And yet the Bible says that they live for themselves. It's, it's all about me. That brings unhappy people. The Bible says that they live their life for themselves to please themselves and they didn't consider the end. That They didn't consider the direction of their life and, and the end of where it would bring them. I remember when I was, uh, before I started working here at the church, I worked at uh, an appliance store and my job with another gentleman was to deliver appliances. And I remember the first day that I was on the job, we had this giant French door side-by-side -side fridge. This thing was massive. It was heavy. And, and we had to carry it up two flights of stairs. And, and, and so we had a fridge cart, and we put it on its side, and, and there was one gentleman at the, on the bottom, and I was at the top, and I would push, and he would, or I would pull, and he would push, and we got it to the very top of those two flights of stairs. And we realized that it wouldn't fit through the door. We had to take it all the way back down. And I realized at that moment, I don't think delivering appliances is God's calling in my life. <laughs> at the end of the day, we didn't consider the end. We were interested in the process, but we weren't so concerned about the product. And the Bible teaches us that they were interested in the process and they enjoyed the process and yet they said we would never lose our children, we would never become widows. No, this won't happen to us and God says in just a moment in one day it's all going to come to pass. You've got to consider where you're heading in your life because the direction of your life always has a destination and God has promised us we will reap what we sow. And so we notice thirdly in our message, the destination of Babylon. Where did their direction lead them in their life? Where did this attitude bring them? Well, the Bible says that it brought them to a dark place. The Bible teaches us that they would lose their children, that they would become a widow, that their life would be filled with sorrow. And yet the Bible says also that they would fall down to a, a powerless God. It says in the Scripture that, that they did not trust the true God. and In fact, the Bible says they trusted in the occult. In verse 9 it says that they would look to sorceries and enchantments. And it, it really speaks here of the occult. It speaks of trusting in the power of the wicked one, of the devil. And I'm talking about mediums and magic today. In the Bible, it is always painted in a bad light. I know today that it is subtle in our world and, and Hollywood presents it as good and wonderful, but magic in the Bible is always presented as something wicked and of the devil. And the Bible says that they looked, they looked to the devil for power and for guidance. And the Bible says that they would not prevail. God says there is no power in these things. In fact, the Bible says that they become a burden to them. All of their studying, all of their research, 
that they look to the astrologers and those who make predictions with the divisions of stars, and they look to the stargazers, those who make predictions uh, predictions from all of the stars, and then they look to the, the, the monthly prognosticators, those who make predictions by the, the, the new moons. And the Bible says in verse 13, he says, these things cannot deliver you. It's interesting today how our world is so concerned about their future. And, and we're always looking to see what our, our future holds. I'm so glad that God doesn't tell me my future. You know why? Because I can't handle it. I can't handle it. God, can you imagine the moment you trust Christ as your Savior, God says, by the way, these are all the things that are going to happen in your life. From, from the moment you trusted Christ to the moment that you leave this earth, these are all the events of your life. That would be a burden. God says the just shall live by faith. We don't need to know the future. We just trust the God of the future. And we know He's in control. And we look to Him every day. And we walk by faith one step at a time. And yet our world today is so concerned about the future. And the, the Bible says here that they cannot help you. They are corrupt. And they are useless. And the Bible says they are not of God. We see not only a powerless God but we see a pointless knowledge in verse 10. The Bible says in verse 10, For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. We find in this passage of Scripture that all of their research and all of their studying and all of their knowledge would not make a difference. In fact, it's interesting because the Bible says it perverted them. You see, the Bible says that it kept them from seeing the true God in their life. And all of their research and all, and all of their studying, the, the Bible says they, they could not see the Lord. They could not see the true God. The Bible says it actually hurt them. And didn't help them. And Christians, I want us to understand that knowledge is a poor substitute for godliness. Listen, I, I think we should study to show ourselves approved. But studying doesn't make us godly people. The reality is, is that studying can actually hurt us and research can actually hurt us. It can drive us away from, from knowing God in a personal way. Understand today, I am all for studying the Bible, but I'm also for obeying the Bible and living the Bible every day of our life. The Bible says, now touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. But Paul said, knowledge puffeth up. It makes us proud. And we know that God does not bless a proud heart. He gives grace to the humble. You see, the reality is we want more than knowledge. We want to know more than just knowing about God. We want to know God. <laughs> when the Apostle Paul said that I may know Him, he wasn't talking about book learning. He was talking about experience. He said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. Paul wanted to experience the power of God in his life. And we could read about people who had their prayers answered and we can read about people who walked with God or we can know Him and experience that for ourselves. And that's what God wants us to do. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they, they weren't educated. They weren't, they weren't men who, who were well-researched in the, the Sanhedrin law. They were ignorant men. They, they were unlearned men. And yet they marveled and they took knowledge. Why? Because they knew that these men have been with Jesus. They walked with Him every day of their life. 
the Bible teaches us in this passage of Scripture that they had a perverse knowledge that kept them from seeing the true God of the Bible. I think for a moment of evolution and all these so-called scientists and studiers of, of the world and, and how all of that study has perverted them from seeing the true God who created the heavens and the earth. But lastly, let us see a promised end. The Bible says in verses 14 to 15 that they would be thrown into the fire as stubble. The thought there of stubble as sticks, as wood. And the Bible says that they would not be able to save themselves. That the fire, the flame would not warm oneself. It, it wasn't for something that you would gather around and enjoy the fire and have a coffee and talk around a fire. No, God says this, this flame would devour them. This is the fire of God's judgment. And all of the resources and allies of, of Babylon, and they were an established people, and they had lots of resources. They had a high position. They had lots of allies. And God says in this passage of Scripture that when the judgment of God comes, these allies will flee. They will run. And God says, no one will be able to help them. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we're reminded of this important principle in our life because I believe all the Bible is for our edification and we can learn from its truths. Babylon would be destroyed because of her pride and because of her focus. And I believe the Bible teaches us to guard ourselves today. Because in one moment, we can be where we never thought we'd be. And God says, listen, you cannot have the attitude, I can never fall. He's saying, take heed today. Don't allow the pleasures of your flesh to be your God and your guide. Protect your walk with God. Be proactive today. The Bible says to be sober and to be vigilant because your adversary, your enemy, the devil. He's walking around. He, he's seeking whom he may devour. Listen, the devil doesn't play games. He's our enemy. And he's looking to devour. God help us today to take heed of the principle of God. And as I look at this passage of Scripture, I'm also reminded of the judgment of God one day for our sins. The Bible says that we can't save ourselves. And no one can save us. A, a Baptist church can't save us. Baptism can't save us. Doing good things for other people can't save us. A pope can't save us. The Bible says that, that we, are, we are lost and undone. And yet the wonderful Savior came, Jesus, to die for us to give us eternal life. And we can put our faith and trust in Him and be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you realize your need for salvation today, call out to Jesus. He will save you. He loves you. He will give you wonderful salvation. Fully trust in Him. God help us today to learn these principles for our life and to take heed to the Word of God. Let's pray together. Lord, thank You so much for this chapter in Your Word and the principles that we can learn.